Bitcoin is the one commodity that you can buy and you can hold where it is absolutely capped 21 million. So if the price goes up by a factor of 100, how, this, do, how do I save my money and how do I transfer it to the next generation? Bitcoin is a solution. Welcome back to Crypto Insights. In this video, we will bring you another set of highlights from Michael Saylor's recent discussion with the founders of Digitra. As always, time is money, so don't forget to like, subscribe, and hit the notification bell to stay updated on the latest developments in the crypto space. I think um, Bitcoin is a brilliant system engineering achievement Agreed. because it is, it is many, many parts. It has servo mechanisms in it, feedback systems. It has very intricate computer mechanisms and economic mechanisms. But the things that I focus on that are very uh, beautiful to me, one is the idea of creating a crypto commodity. How, how do you create an asset without an issuer that nobody controls that is self-sustaining? Yeah. And that's the first in human history. That is really a beautiful thing. It's, it's definitely the king crypto yeah. commodity. The other thing that's really beautiful about it is this brilliant leap from commodity to scarcity. It's the first time in human history that we created a commodity with a hard supply. Every money in history, glass beads and bales of tobacco and stone coins and copper tokens and paper currency and cigarettes and fiat currency, all of those things were uncapped. Every other commodity, soybeans and oil and natural gas and gold and silver, uncapped. We can create more of them. Land, timber, real estate. You can even extract land from the sea. You can create yes, more exactly. of it. Bitcoin is the one commodity that you can buy and you can hold where it is absolutely capped 21 million. So if the price goes up by a factor of 100, the supply is invariant. There is no other commodity where the supply is invariant to the demand or to the price. That makes it perfect money. It makes it the best store of value asset. Most other commodities are much worse. If a commodity has a stock to flow ratio of one and you produce, you know, twice as much, you know, or the equivalent supply every year, it's not going to be good money. If the stock to flow is 50, it might be better money if you only inflate the supply by 2% a year, like gold. But it's still not great because every 30 years, you cut, the, you cut your money in half if you inflate 2% a year. So this leap from the idea that there should be a 2% inflation rate to the idea that there should be a 0% inflation rate, that's a profound idea. Most classically trained economists and all yeah, the Keynesians exactly. would tell you 2%. 2% is the right number. We want 2% inflation. But 2% gives you a half-life of 30 years. 1%, you get to 72 years. 0%, you live forever. There's a pretty big difference between 0 and 200 so, basis points. Yeah, One yeah. thing is you live forever. You're immortal. And the other thing is 30-year half-life. <laughs> you know, so... Exactly. So you don't think it's a lot, but it's profound. Do you want a building that will stand forever? Or do you want a building that will crumble in 30 years? And once you start thinking about that, you realize if you build a capital structure of a company or a family or a country on an asset that's crumbling every 30 years, your civilization is going to struggle. Gold's got a half-life of 30 years. The U.S. dollar is inflating about 7 to 8% every year. It gives you a half-life of 10 years. Most currencies inflate at 14% a year. It gives you a half-life of five years. Five years and then exactly. some currencies inflate and have a half-life of 18 months. And so you start and ask the question, I want to build a, a, a government. I want to build a family. I want to build a company. I want to build a nonprofit. I want to build a bank on a capital structure that will last forever or 30 years or 10 years or two years. Yeah. And so that second idea of scarcity, that's a very brilliant breakthrough. The third idea that's a breakthrough is, uh, 
is uh, transactional scarcity, second order scarcity. The fact that there's only one block every 10 minutes or the fact that there's only four megabyte blocks or there's only 4,000 transactions, maybe seven transactions a second. A lot of people think that's a bug. That's a feature. It's that's a feature. actually how you enforce security and you create a market economy in transactions. So you won't have first order scarcity if you don't have second order scarcity. So Satoshi was smart enough to realize that you just can't move the Bitcoin around every second because the security will collapse and the stability of the network will collapse. And I, th I think that that was uh, very brilliant. And the last brilliancy is the use of proof of work and SHA-256 hashing and not crippling it by saying, we're not going to allow you to do ASICs. Because there's a point where some people said, we don't want you to do ASICs, that's cheating. Yeah. yeah and there's yeah. other, but with Bitcoin, they let you build an ASIC to generate 256 hashes. And the right answer is to be able to do ASICs because an ASIC is a silicon machine with a 2000 to one mechanical advantage over a CPU. And that means that you can put uh, you can put $20 billion of capital in the Bitcoin network and defend it with a 2,000 to 1 advantage against all of the Google and the Apple and the Amazon and the Microsoft networks. So you see, if you didn't have the ASIC, then you would have to spend as much on CPUs as they. And so a big company could overwhelm the system and destabilize it. But because we have a, a very particular proprietary protocol, or SHA-256, a special protocol, and because you can create a very efficient Bitcoin miner, it means that you can constantly upgrade the energy efficiency and the thermodynamic efficiency of that equipment. And that means that whoever controls all the Bitcoin mining equipment can defend the network. And that is profoundly important because that opens the door to defend a hundred trillion dollars of assets with only ten or twenty billion dollars yeah. of hardware, right? And right. that's a pretty big idea, right? A silicon machine for security. The other implication is when I spend twenty or thirty billion on hardware, the only thing you can do is defend the network. And so if you go bankrupt and someone seizes your equipment, they have to defend the network, right? So the only thing you're ever going to do with Bitcoin mining is to defend the network and secure the network. And, and that's a very useful feature of the network because naturally what it means is the, the, the network has a 12-year security frequency. When, when it becomes non-profitable to mine Bitcoin, it'll still run for 12 more years. Yeah because the equipment is already sunk cost and you can't do anything else with it. And, uh, and naturally, what happens is, is once you've invested to know how to build a Bitcoin miner, then you'll keep producing Bitcoin mining equipment even at a 5% variable margin. So you'd sell the first machine for 10,000, you'll sell the next machine for 1,500, yeah. you'll sell the next machine for 800 plus 50 dollars. So you're going to keep shipping yes. security equipment, even if the price collapses, even if the profitability collapses. When the money is scarce, everything else will be abundant. Yeah. And when exactly. the money is abundant, everything else you want will be scarce. And Bitcoin represents first order scarcity in the monetary policy, 21 million. Yeah. Second order scarcity in the transaction velocity, 7 TPS. Third order scarcity with the hash rate, SHA-256 hashing and, and hashing equipment. And fourth order scarcity, only a few people know how to create and manufacture these hashing machines. Yeah. And so all of that scarcity maintains the integrity and the security of the network over time. And because the integrity of the network is secured, that means that the Bitcoin can, can be used as a foundation to build trillions and then tens and hundreds of trillions of dollars of other applications on top of it. The, uh, the simple metaphor I would offer is consider the schist or the granite that's underneath New York City. That land is 200 million years old. 
Yeah. It hasn't <laughs> moved. Exactly. It hasn't moved in 200 million years. You don't want it to move, but you can build 100 story buildings on it, drive millions of cars on it, run electricity through it, launch hundreds of thousands of companies, live hundreds of millions of lives, do trillions and trillions of things. But what is the granite's role? Just don't sink, right? Yeah. Don't move, Agreed. don't yeah. sink, yeah. don't deflect. Yeah. Bitcoin is that granite. Bitcoin is the basis of the, the digital capital market. And so Bitcoin is a worldwide open capital network. It allows all 8 billion people to trade with each other. So it allows us to move billions of dollars of capital between New York and Tokyo. Or it'll, it allows hundreds of millions of companies to trust each other. How do I trade between Africa and South America and Europe and Asia? Uh, you know, and how do I settle and move the capital? And then how do I build the applications on top of it? The 20th century was built on credit. The 19th century is built on gold. It used to yeah, be, exactly. you know, the story mm -hmm. was Spanish sent gold across the ocean. And if your ship sunk, you lose the capital. It's a big yeah, problem. Exactly. If, uh, if the ship gets washed into a shore, you lose the capital. It's very slow. It takes six months or a year to move the capital. So eventually, with the telegraph, we decided we were going to move the capital via credit, a bank check, or, a, or some bank draft. And that worked in the 20th century. But the problem with credit is credit is very expensive, very fragile, very risky. If I wanted to move... If I wanted to move a million dollars 40 times on a credit network, it takes about a month to settle each time and it's a 2% fee. And so if I do a credit card transaction a million times, it'll take four years and the banks will have all the million dollars as fees. And so the money doesn't move on a credit network very effectively. It is slow, it is expensive. What you want is a money network where you can move the money 40 times in one minute for a penny. No settlement risk. And what Bitcoin offers is it offers that much more industrial strength settlement network and the layers above it, the layers two and the layer three will just allow you to move money at the speed of light, friction free. Anybody can open a bank, anybody can start a bank or an exchange anywhere in the world on the weekend writing to the Bitcoin protocol without yeah. asking permission to anybody else. And nobody anywhere in the world can open up a, a company that will integrate with the proprietary systems of the 20th century. <laughs> you could have 20 years and a thousand lawyers and you still wouldn't be able to plug into one of those systems if someone doesn't like you. So the 21st econ century economy, it's it's based on open standards and protocols and digital energy, digital property, yeah. digital money. The, the 20th century was based upon credit. You know, when I buy it and I bought 214,246, when I buy the next one, it will increase the value of your Bitcoin. Yeah, exactly. Everybody in the world that's got smart money, everybody's got your problem. They want to keep their money. They want to give it to their children. Everybody, you know, every corporation, every charity, every family, there's nobody that wants to lose all their money. And they're all worried about, can I trust the currency? Can I trust the bank? Can I trust the company? Will I get my, will my bill, building get taxed? Can I afford property taxes? How, how do I uh, save my money and how do I transfer it to the next generation? Bitcoin is a solution. You should put in the work to determine whether you agree. If you don't agree, then you save your money. But if you get to the point where you become comfortable, you start to realize that you've got the same problem billions of other people have. There's one solution which is better than every other option. So far, hundreds of millions of people have chosen it. Hundreds of billions of dollars have been invested in it. There's 1.4 trillion in the network. We think it's going to keep growing. If you join the network, you benefit along with the rest of us. And if yeah. you don't join the network, then it grows without you. And, you, and then you better pick something else that you love that you think is better.